Hello, everybody. Welcome to our author talk on a good bake. If you're just tuning in, feel free to use the chat function to let us know where you are listening in from tonight. Wow, hello from London. Highland Park, Illinois, hello. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Heldsburg, California, Houston, Texas. Wow, we're getting everyone from all over. So good to have you here tonight. Thank you for joining us. Hey, from Ballard. <laughs> okay, well, we're gonna give this a few more minutes as folks are trickling into the Zoom room and we'll get started in just a moment. Um, but as you all are joining us tonight, uh, welcome. My name is Megna. I am a staff member here at the Book Larder in Seattle. Uh, we are a cookbook store and we're based in the Fremont neighborhood of Seattle and um, recently have transitioned all of our events to virtual format uh, due to COVID. Um, one of the happy surprises and perks, I guess, of having all digital events is clearly we can welcome in folks from all over the country and all over the world. So thanks for joining us today. Um, we're gonna get started here in a few moments. Um, I just wanted to take, the, take a moment to, um, to thank our, uh, our authors tonight. Uh, we're gonna be speaking to Melissa Weller, who's a James Beard Award nominee and a chef. Um, she's the author of The Good Bake. Um, so that's what we'll be talking about tonight. So we have signed copies here at Book Larder. Um, so you can check out our website, booklarder.com, if you'd like to purchase a copy. And I will drop a, um, a link into the chat if you're interested in checking it out. Um, Melissa will be speaking to cookbook, fellow cookbook author Susan Spungen. Um, and we will also be um, watching a demonstration. Melissa is going to demonstrate how to um, make her ketchup worry from the book. So, uh, so stay tuned for that. If you have any questions during the event, um, please drop them into the Q&A function. It should be at the very bottom of your screen. Um, and Susan will uh, read some of those questions as we um, get to the end of the event. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in there and you can use the chat function um, to speak to each other or send direct messages to any of the panelists tonight. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we will we'll run the show tonight and we will finish um, in, a, in about an hour. So uh, we'll have an hour to, to chat with Melissa and Susan and learn about Kachapuri. Um, that's, that's all that I have for you. I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa and Susan. Uh, thank you again for joining us and welcome. Thank you, Michael. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Susan. Hi, Melissa. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? I'm good. Um, so it's so wonderful to, uh, this is actually, well, no, it's not, it's not my first Zoom. <laughs> um, <laughs> but maybe it's my first author event. So it's sort cool. of an, an interesting, uh, an interesting twist, right? Yeah, it is. I, I don't think I have Zoom. I, I'm not good at Zoom. I don't think You're I do it. not good at it? <laughs> no, but my my son who's in remote schooling uh, does it all the time. So when I need help, I just ask him. <laughs> I'm going to bring the chat up so I can see what people are oh, saying. Gosh. And don't you worry about that. You're oh. going to demo your kachapuri. I so am. Tell, so I want to, I have lots of questions for you and we never are, are short of talking we never are uh, at a loss for something to talk about. I have met Melissa once in person, and uh, and then we spoke on the on the phone last week. Yeah. And we we just kind of get into a gab fest. I'm not sure why you're just yeah. I don't know if you're that kind of person or if it's the relationship <laughs> between the two of us. But we never seem to have a shortage of subjects to talk about. So I'm looking forward to talking to you tonight. So first of all, I've spent some time with your book tonight. And as you, you can you see, I've- You all of that. whoa. <laughs> yes, I did. Wow. Oh my gosh. Um, well, I just wanted to show people a few of the recipes. I don't know if people have the book already. Hey, my brother is here and he's calling me Sue, which is not my name, okay? He's the only person in the world that's allowed to call me Sue. Wow. Susan, for all something. the people here, it's, 
Susan. <laughs> so anyway, the book, first of all, it's the heaviest book I have right now. Wow. So it's just such a solid piece of work. And I mean that, I mean, it's, it's really incredibly beautiful and it's obviously, you know, was a labor of love and, and, uh, you know, a long time coming because, yeah. and I read your introduction and I hope everybody will read the introduction of this wow. book because it does tell your whole story, which if people either have the book or don't yet have the book, um, and, or even if you haven't and haven't read the introduction, I just want you to talk about a little bit, you know, that you were a yeah. career changer yeah. and what you did before. Yeah. Well, so, okay, I'm 48 years old and I went to college in the early 90s and I graduated in 1995 and I, I started working in an engineering job and I, won, I didn't like the job and I started baking and cooking at home. I used to host dinner parties in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And, you know, I have to say, Susan, one of the greatest inspirations at that time for me was Martha Stewart Living Magazine. <laughs> and you were the food editor. Correct me, I don't know the title, I don't know your title, but I remember you were the food editor yeah. of the magazine. I mean, it was like editorial director, food and entertaining, but yeah. I just would say food editor because that was yeah. more uh, cool. descriptive. Yeah. And I, I was so inspired by everything in that magazine at that time. And that was right at the time of like there weren't a lot of recipes on the internet. And I would just, I would buy the magazine and I would buy cookbooks and I just mm -hmm. really wanted to A, be better at, at making things from the cookbooks. And I really like coveted having like a pastry or a bread or a savory like culinary career. And mm -hmm. so it, it took a long time. I, I moved to California. I, mm -hmm. I started working in restaurants in California in the late nineties. And that made me feel like nervous. I'm like, it was a big switch to go from engineering all of a sudden to working in the front of the house at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And so I took another engineering job in San Diego, which I was there for a couple of years in the early 2000s, working on fuel cell engines. <laughs> and I, you know, I didn't like that either, but I still was baking a lot at home. Yeah. Um, and then I, I was like, no, this is a bad fit. So when the company closed, I, I volunteered to work at a restaurant in San Diego for free so I could learn something. And, you know, that was right at the time that Claudia Fleming's cookbook came out, uh, the, the last course. And right. I was so inspired by that. And I was just so inspired by anybody who was doing anything really, which, which I thought was remarkable in the culinary industry mm -hmm. that I'm like, I really want to move back to the East coast. I'm from Pennsylvania. So I, in 2003, I moved to New York and I went to the French culinary Institute and I started working in restaurants in 2003 and I haven't stopped. I mm -hmm. surprisingly <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> and then I, and then I never felt ready to write a cookbook. Mm -hmm. I never felt like I had enough knowledge and enough information and that's that I know that's a sort of a personal thing like that's really everybody has a different like trajectory and a different mm -hmm. timeline and for mm -hmm. me it just took a long time until I felt like I was ready and well so we're I glad think, that you waited yeah. because you've given us this incredible book um yeah so I'm gonna let you start on your demo because and so we can Here's talk it. and fake at the same yeah. time because otherwise we're never going to get through it but um so tell us a little bit about the kachapuri and, and why so I, it's in the book why uh, it's yeah. what it where does it fit in how does it fit in i well i love say i wanted there to be some savory most of the book is pastry related and cookies and pies and cakes right. and viennoiserie and i wanted there to be some savory things in the book and one of the things so there's a savory chapter in the beginning of the book and one of the one of the breads that's in the and and most of the breads in the beginning of the book are enriched, so that means they have a little bit of fat added to them. Right. And this is a bread that I made a few years ago and loved, and didn't know too much about the origins of it at the time. It's mm -hmm. trendy in New York, so somebody mm -hmm. asked me to make it. I'm like, okay, I'll make it. Uh. Um, so like, no, that happens all the time. But then I fell in love yeah. with it. Right. It's called Capricori. It comes from the it comes from Georgia, the Republic of Georgia. And it's and and I had a, a a year ago at the bakery I had a Russian baker and he of course he knew what kachapuri was right. 
because right. um, it was very trendy there. And it's somewhat trendy here. And I don't know if it's yeah. trendy across the United States. It's probably not. But I probably love it. not it's yet. It's like a pizza, but it's not. Um, right. And it, it basically, it's a flatbread. It's a yeasted flatbread. And mm -hmm. it's like you roll cheese up in the crust. It's like a crust, cheese crust, like boat bread. Yeah. Um, and you bake an egg in the center of it. And that's just one variation of cacciapori. There are other right. variations. Right. And I just love this bread and have like since done a little bit of research about cacciapori and other other foods from that area. But I really right. thought that it was a special and also delicious bread. To is it originally a street food? Do you know? Is it a street food? It is. I believe yeah. so. I believe yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So I I am going to demonstrate. You can follow the rest if you have the book. You can follow the recipe and you basically mix the dough. Um, you let the dough rise for two hours. Then you divide it and round it into balls of dough. And then you put those balls in your refrigerator to chill down overnight. And then you shape it. And so I wanted to start by demonstrating. I have a ball, I have one of the balls of dough. And I was going to start by shaping the ball of dough. What that means is rolling it out. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate right here. So um, I hope everybody can see, but I and I also want to point out that she that Melissa has all these amazing how to's for some of the trickier recipes in the book. So Melissa, I'm just holding up that page yeah. right now so they can see the oh, really great. helpful, helpful yeah. how to's in the book. I noticed that for the Danish, I, I was like, all right, I want to make this Danish braid, but yeah. I don't know. It looks really hard, but then I saw No, it's not. And, <laughs> okay. I um this dough this dough I I think it's easy and you're basically yeah. just using a rolling pin to roll it out into a circle. Right. Um, you have I don't know you probably can't tell how much flour I've used but I've used a good bit of flour, and I think that it's easiest to roll out when it's cold. Right. Um, and I let it sit out while we were talking so it's a little warmer and it yeah. springs back yeah. a little bit more. But I'm gonna right. keep rolling it, and then once it's ten inches in diameter, I stop. And I start sprinkling cheese on it. See, it's Can I ask back. you something? Since yeah. you did the diameter, but how thin? Oh, like it's, it's, thin? it's about an eighth of an inch thick. Okay. okay. Yeah. But I always, I always have, I always have a ruler handy, Susan. <laughs> Don't <laughs> doesn't everybody? Do I do too. You have to, but you know, you know, I, it's, it's I in a perfect helpful. Yeah. Thickness and a it's diameter. It's true. In a professional yeah. kitchen, almost everything is by thickness. Like when you're yeah. rolling out croissant dough, you're doing it by millimeters. It's like you, you do it to five millimeters thick. And it right. was a lot of, it took a lot of time to try to get the other dimensions whenever I was writing the book. Right, so this, right, right. This is 10 inches. And I have my cheese ready. I grated it. And it's a mixture of cheddar, aged cheddar, Gruyere and feta cheese. And I tried to make it as close to the original cacciapori cheese as I could. And I like the aged the aged cheeses because they add a lot of tang and flavor. Sure. sure. Um, and so I spread it over the surface. It's sort of like a pizza. My son got really excited this evening. He's like, I'm gonna eat cacciapori. I was like, he's like, what's <laughs> cacciapori? And then he's like, I get to eat cacciapori. <laughs> and then he was like, then I'm like, but you don't get to eat it until nine o'clock. <laughs> and then he was like, oh, okay. And now I'm talking about him too much and he's making faces at me. <laughs> and so I have the cheese. I have the cheese spread out. I don't know how my lighting is. I don't know. No, we can, can see. see we can see it really well. Okay. I have the cheese spread out and I have a little bit of a perimeter around. And then I just start rolling. It's sort of like you're making a, like a cinnamon roll log. And you're rolling the cheese up in the log and you roll the, the bottom up and I sort of pinch it as I go because otherwise it feels like it wants to unravel. Right. So I do the bottom and then I do the same with the top. And then once I get about like this, so there's about two to three inches in between mm -hmm. the top and the bottom. I just mm -hmm. work on the side. So it's like an oblong, almost like a football. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the sides want to sort of pop open. So I'll twist them tight, 
close. Ah, okay. So I'm going to try to bring it closer to the screen. <laughs> but you can probably see oh, yeah. it in the book better. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then I just basically transfer it to, I have, this is a small sheet tray, but I, I transfer it to a, a sheet tray. And sometimes I line, sometimes I'll, oh, perfect. Sometimes I'll refrigerate it before I bake it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And that's just because in a professional kitchen, we're like tasks sure. are making like 30 or 40 of them at sure. a time. Sure. And so if you, if you don't refrigerate them, they'll keep proofing. So we'll just right. like make them and refrigerate them until we're ready to bake them and then bake them all off at the same time. But sure. But that, that's really helpful that. for, that's really helpful for people at home though, too, which so many books don't include those kind of instructions, but to tell you that you can wait and leave it in your yeah. fridge until you're ready to bake. Yeah, I think I use the refrigerator so much and, and yeah. that's really why. And it's really to help me and help help you if you're at home too. So this one, it doesn't have to go in the refrigerator. It can go into the oven right away. Before I put it in the oven, I um, take a little bit of, and I guess this is the bread baker in me I want the outside crust to not be so dry. And so I'm going to coat it with a little water to help it sort of steam and, and yeah. sort of cook, it will cook the starches a little bit better. Mm. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. I guess I could use egg wash too. But no, I no, I use I water. I use water on my pies, but see, not being a, a ah. chemical engineer, I, I didn't know that's what it was doing. I just liked... I like putting water and sugar on my pie crust because it makes oh. it crunchy, but oh, I didn't I like realize that. it was helping the starch cook. Yeah. Oh, I like that a lot. What did you study in college, Susan? Art. Art. Oh, I'm envious. <laughs> so that's what, one of the things that's so interesting about talking to you and, you know, the subtitle of the book is the art and science of making perfect pastries cooks cakes, cookies, pies, and breads at home. And I think what's so interesting, I'm more of the artist, you know, I come yeah, at it. Yeah. I'm I, like a friend of mine called me a jazz cook at one point. Like I'm completely opposite of you being, having a more scientific approach, although you have to pay attention to science. But so I'm really looking forward to getting into some of the recipes, especially for the laminated doughs oh, and like learning, that. because I can tell that they're going to work perfectly because you oh, explain every detail. That. Yeah. I think I didn't want to be a scientist or an engineer. <laughs> I wanted to be an artist, but that was right. for, for my my parents, like in the 80s, that was not acceptable choice at all. Right, it was like right, something right. professional. Like it was either engineering or be a, doc, a medical doctor or a lawyer. Those are oh, the only wow. options that my parents would discuss with me. And so I went into this <laughs> college with the idea that, okay, well, I'll be a chemical engineer because I was good at chemistry, but I didn't really feel like I loved it at all. And that was right, sort of like, right, that was right. Well, how could you? How could you love myself. that? How no, can I, you love chemical engineering? <laughs> I don't even know what that is exactly. <laughs> well, I think some people must enjoy or love what they do with it, but it didn't, yeah. you know, I feel like I'm very visual and I am drawn to the arts. And so it didn't really fit with me, even though I was good at it. And so that took right, a long time right. to like, sort of like, maybe, right. yeah. and I think I've never really sort of like gotten out of like that sort of mindset. Like once you go down that path of studying engineering, I didn't just study engineering, but I worked for like, at least, I can't even remember, at least five years in engineering, then it sort of, sort of sticks with you. Um, <laughs> Somebody in the chat says, I'm an engineer and love it and love baking too. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. I'm going to put this one in the oven and then okay. I have- What did you another, sprinkle? What did you sprinkle on I there? I sprinkled nigella seeds on okay. it. Okay, great. And I okay. and also, I, I think I missed sprinkling. I have some like Malden flaky sea salt. Yeah. So now it's going to go in, my oven's over here. So I'll be right okay. back. Okay, bye. <laughs> So yeah, chemical engineering. We've got a few people uh, chiming in about chemical engineering. <laughs> That's funny. And Melissa. Okay, now That's I'm coming good... back because okay. now. Oh, is... look, magic. So it, bakes, it bakes for 20 minutes at 400 degrees and it looks like this. And this one just came out of the oven. Mm -hmm. 
And then so, what you do yeah. is, and I think, you know, I, 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 the last time I made this was when we did the photo shoot for my book, which was, that was almost a year and a half, almost two years ago. Wow. And when I first did it, this looks really pale. And I, right. I made a couple earlier and I'm like, oh no, that's the wrong temperature. And then I like thought I would did, made a mistake in the book, but I didn't. <laughs> and so 400 degrees, it should look this pale. And then what you do is, you take an egg and you you crack the egg into the cheese oh. like that okay and then i like to um just sort of season the egg mm -hmm. so i've got some salt and then i also have some um some pepper and then then you increase the temperature of the oven to 450 degrees and bake the uh, egg for, for just 10 minutes. So I'm gonna put it back in the oven. Okay. Yeah, lots of people are, we have someone else that said that her husband is a chemical engineer and a physician and he is amazing in the kitchen baking. So um, that's what I, I wanted to know, like what, what, what is it? like where was the crossover for you that helped you be a better baker from chemical engineering? Oh, that's such a good question. Well, okay. So I think if I think about my culinary career, I, you know, first you have to just work for somebody and, right. and I, you know, I really wanted to work in a bakery in New York and this was maybe in 2003 and there weren't a lot of good bread bakeries. Right. No, to, there weren't. Wanted, you know, I studied in France in college for yeah. a, a year. And I was, I, I just coveted making the best baguette. I just wanted to know how I wanted to, that was like the, 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 the top of whatever for me, the, the goal was to make a baguette. And I was like, well, where do I go in New York to learn how to make a baguette in 2003? And I couldn't really find the right fit, but I ended up getting a job at Babo. Um, and mm -hmm. I worked for the pastry chef, Gina De Palma. Yeah. And she was incredible. And I worked for her for two years. It was mostly like cakes and tarts. And I learned so yeah. much, mm -hmm. but I was just essentially doing what she told me to do, like following instructions and, you know, sort of using your, 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 your brain as much as you, as you can. And then I think it was when I took a bread job at Sullivan street bakery, then right. I was like, okay, well, I have to understand there is more with yeast in terms of understanding what's going on. And I'm like, okay, well, I need to understand what's going on. And I was just trying to read it. I felt like I didn't know anything. Like there are all of these bakers around me who've been in their jobs and most of them are immigrants, male immigrants. And most of them are like been doing their jobs forever. And I'm like, well, I just want to know how they know this. Like, how do they know this? And I was like, <laughs> so I would read about it. And I was like, okay, well, then I'd start to think about it from like, from like science point of view, because I feel like bread is a lot about science. Sure, you know, like, it is. I, I'm like baking, like pastry, like cakes and cookies, they're science too, but I didn't really think of them that way because I didn't mm -hmm. feel like they were as complicated to understand as working with anything with yeast. I yeah, felt yeah. like with yeast, I'm like, okay, I really need to understand this. And I think that that's probably when I started to like think more about like science but I still don't think I think about science. I just think of it sort of more of a natural, like, right. okay, if you do this, then that happens. And sure. maybe that's sort of a practical skill that most bakers in a professional bakery have. Like, they don't yeah. necessarily say, okay, this is because of this in science right. terms, but they can see it because they've been right. making it for so sure. many years in the, sure. the so many re repetitions. Mm -hmm. So, because so, I mean, a lot of um, cooking and baking is also about intuition you know, yeah, and an inspiration. Is. I mean, all of those things it come is. together, but with baking, you can't forget about the scientific part. Obviously it's a really important part. You can't just, especially if you're developing a recipe, you can't just change three things to find out what's gonna happen. You can yeah. only change one thing at a time, really, sure. to do a good experiment, am I right? It's so true. <laughs> I, remember, I remember talking to you when we last, I don't a couple of years ago. Yeah. And I remember you were talking to me about like testing a recipe and you were saying something about like you had to do it two or three times to get it where you wanted it to be. Or it was something yeah. like, I just remember you did it two or three times. And I was thinking, oh, it's the same for me because I'm like, you can only change one thing at a time to like see what happens and try to like get that like 
cookie or like pie or like bread that you want. Yeah. Oh yeah. You definitely have to. And sometimes I, I feel like there's like one recipe that is never done. Like yeah. you have to just go to print however it is. Oh, that's <laughs> true. Not satisfied. Yeah. I remember that at work at, at work. And I remember this, I remember this mostly when I was working at per se, because I had to change the bread menu all the time. And there'd always be one that just didn't work and I could make it like 10 times. And I'm like, it's not yeah. working. It's not working. Yeah. I'm like, I just let it go. Just let it go. Mm -hmm. Come back to mm -hmm. it at a later time. I guess you can't, if you're doing a, a, a book, but like, well, you can, like, you can come it back. It's better to come back. Sometimes. Forget about the yeah. one that's not working. Yeah. 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 It's yeah just, I still have and, those right now. I'm like, there are definitely some recipes right now that aren't working. And I'm like, okay, I'll just keep moving on with the ones that I can like get done. <laughs> there's uh actually somebody um the person asking the question um vicky tran can you put your uh oh, yeah. question in the q a instead of in the chat so we can get to it later um i'll we'll get to it later um but yeah i mean wow i mean i can see that it, why it took you so long to write this book because i mean i love that for you it's a culmination and your of years of baking professionally and that you're sharing all these incredible recipes that you've been keeping track of on a spread on spreadsheets is that right as opposed to me which would be like maybe a note in my phone or <coughs> scribble somewhere i don't even know how to make a spreadsheet but so i'm, I'm like oh, I, I, I don't i don't know how to make a spreadsheet so um you know i wish i was that organized but it must have really been helpful in putting together this book I don't think it's about being organized. I think it's about, I think it goes back to engineering because <laughs> I had to in college. Right, and right. Now remember, I went to college in 1990. It was right before computers. I brought right. my electric <laughs> typewriter with me. Uh, <laughs> and they said, oh, no. no, 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 no. You have to use a, a computer. And we had to use Excel and we had to use Word. And so oh. I had to use it. I didn't have a choice. And so then it became about organizing the recipes, especially baking recipes in a bakery where you need different sizes of right. the amount that you're making. Right, it's right, right, right. Easier right. to do it in Excel. Oh, much, much easier. Yeah. But I don't think and it's about organization. I just think it's about background and being like coming from that engineering background sure, sure. of like yeah. using an Excel spreadsheet all the time. Right. I mean, I never even learned how to type. No, I, I still, understand. I still hunt and pack on a computer. So I'm very yeah. much like, I'm, I don't know which side of the brain that is, but. So I'm going to make this for sure. Oh, that's great. That looks that incredible. One. Beautiful. That is the, um, <laughs> what is that? That's the, that's carrot, the carrot, carrot bread. Yeah. And that looks so it, incredible. Yeah. It's not, it's not sweet either. Really. It's more I know, savory. I, I would like that. And I like it. It's so bright orange because it's made with carrot juice. Mm. I'm curious though, if I, can I use my starter? Cause you just, it's a, it's a yeast recipe, but can I use my starter? I, yeah. How do yeah. I transfer? That's hard to figure out though. Cause then you have to take some of the liquid out of the no, recipe, you, right? No, I wouldn't do no? that. I would just oh. take, I would just take the amount of flour in the recipe. Yeah. And I would multiply that by, 20%. So multiply it by 0.2. Okay. And that's the amount of starter you just add. Mm. Add that. Okay. Or would I use two? No, because carrots would make it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to call you about this. <laughs> 15%. So maybe because carrots would like, there's sugar in the carrots, right? <laughs> oh, well, I forgot. Much. All right. Now but, I'm going to use no, yeast. I'm going to use yeast. <laughs> I'm going to use these. So um, somebody, everyone's putting all kinds of things in the chat about all the recipes they've made already, which is great. Oh, People have made nice. the babka and um, one person made, um, wow, People love the book. It's the, the photography is really gorgeous. Johnny did an amazing yeah. job. Okay, somebody made the cinnamon babka, the oatmeal raisin, and the sugar cookies. And then someone else said they made um, 
Uh, da, 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 very much. All right, I can't find it right now. But anyway, we'll get back to that. Somebody is also asking if you didn't like eggs, can you just make the kachapuri without the egg? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I, I think in, at one of the restaurants I worked at, I put ham in it. I like oh, put a piece, some pieces of ham and rolled up the ham. And yeah. there's a variation in the cookbook that just uses kale and cheese. Mm. And yeah. I like that too. And like ketchup puri, it's not just this, this was the boat shape. Yeah. Ketchup puri can also be like, it's almost like a double crust pizza with sure. stuffing inside. Yeah, um, yeah. It's like a calzone kale, that's open. You can so stick it to anything, anything, I think. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> it definitely seems to be like a pizza. So I have another uh, random question for you. In one of the portraits uh, of you in your book, you have your uh, Apple Watch. Oh, you're wearing your Apple Watch oh. now. So I'm curious to know if you use the t is, you use a timer or like, do you, how do you use your Apple Watch in your baking? I bought it for the timer. I'm See, so I'm embarrassed thinking, to admit I'm, that. No, I'm thinking you can, I should you have can that. put the timer in it because what was happening is most bakeries, most restaurants in New York City, you have to go between the basement right. and the sure. first floor. Right. And right. so I right. was running back and forth between the right. basement and the first floor. And I could carry a timer in my pocket or my phone, but I'd always like bump it off. Uh, so I was using yeah. this for the timer. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Speaking of timer, I think. So if anyone from Apple is listening, for our cook, for cooks, could you please have more than one timer? I mean, we need to have like timer one, timer two, timer three, because we often have several things going, right? Yes. <laughs> All right, this one. Same. Oh, that's amazing, Claire. I was just reading Claire's uh, message. She's a college student and she's very excited to start baking from the book. Oh, wow. Somebody's actually said they work at Apple and have asked for that so many times. Oh, yes, but I, I did want to add that through the <laughs> pandemic, I started running. Oh, and I okay. now I'm using the watch also for like, I think it was probably meant more for athletic purposes too. Right. For a yeah. while I was using it for text messages and like that's bad because you're getting watch. text messages all the time, uh, even oh, if you don't want to you... know what they are. Right, 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 um, right. Oh, so what do we have here? This is this is the baked kachapuri with the egg oh, in it. Yeah. I think the one that I, this is the one that I showed with cracking the egg on it. Uh, and yeah. I am going to finish it with a little bit of salt and a little bit of, I guess there's already salt. I'm gonna add a little bit more salt. So I um, guess you'd really have to, I've never had a kachapuri, but I guess you'd have to eat this with a knife and fork. because It'd be a little messy to just eat it out of hand, wouldn't it? You can eat it with a knife and, knife and fork, or you can let it cool down just a little bit, and then you can right. rip off the ends, and you can dip the ends in the egg. That's how I, I like to eat it. <laughs> I didn't think anyone was listening when I said, Apple, are you listening? But two people oh, either work there or know someone that works there. But I have to tell you, these people, please pass it along, Alexandra Holbrook, um, because, I mean, really, I use my timer on my phone all the time uh, yeah. and and I just always I'm needing a second timer so there's yeah, probably no, an I app the, a I second love the timer yeah. on it yeah. and now I also love the athletic fun the other athletic functions on it too right obviously but the time right. for the for a baker and it's also if you're working with dough you get your hands all messy oh, and it's yeah, waterproof yeah, yeah, yeah. you can just right. wash it oh awesome. unlike your That's phone amazing. I was like getting flour in my oh, phone yeah. Well, also, because I'm constantly also taking pictures with my phone at the yeah. same time. So my phone gets all greasy. And then, yeah. like, I, I did an um, Instagram Live a couple of weeks ago for New York Times Cooking, and my screen was all dirty. And so I looked like I was, like, in a cloud. <laughs> <laughs> really embarrassing. <laughs> I know. This is the COVID world that we live in. <laughs> I know we're just managing. So um, I have a question because, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, I bake, but I don't cook or I cook, but I don't bake. So do you cook? I cook. Yeah. I, to me, I don't understand doing one and not the other. Yeah. I, all... you know, I never, Go I on. never decided when I was doing everything at home that I was just going to do one or the other. Yeah. And I love cooking. 
Yeah. And it just happened that I, I followed a path because an opportunity was presented to me to do pastry in a, in a mm. professional kitchen. Uh -huh. And I love making bread, but I love right. cooking too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you they're obviously, cooking, right? oh yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'm a baker, but I'm not a baker the way you're a baker. You know, I, yeah. I, I'm not, um, I'm definitely not as precise. So I'm actually really looking forward to, um, making some of these recipes so I can, uh, I mean, we all know that the best way to get better is to practice, right? So if yeah, you don't right. do it, I really want to make this because I love cheese Danish and oh, nice. this looks incredible. This reminds me of like Entenmann's, but like a hundred thousand <laughs> times better. I love that. I love that. I, that recipe came from when I was working at Sedell's and uh -huh. I had to make, I wanted to make Danish and Danish is like crispy, like it's sort of like croissant dough and yeah. it's laminated. And I'm like, yeah. okay, when we started tasting it, it was like too crunchy. We're like, no, 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 mm. New York Danish is like sort of soft and squishy. You can get it at the bodega and it comes wrapped in plastic. So how do you do that? And so I <laughs> took a, a different dough. I took my babka dough actually, mm. and I laminated it. Uh -huh. And it's really easy. It's easy. Lamination is like when you're adding the, you know, oh, this like cool. butter packet, like yeah. making croissant dough, the butter sure. packet, and then you're, you're, you're folding it and rolling it out yeah. and making mm -hmm. different folds. And yeah. the, the Danish only has two letter folds. And I think it's easy to do. Mm. And I think, I think it looks more, I think, I think the effort looks harder than it actually is right. because I think right. it actually turns out really beautiful. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking, I don't know when I'm going to make it, but I am going to make yeah. it at some point. And then I definitely want to make these and I never had one when you were at Roberta. So tell us the story. Of oh, this. that's great. So these salted caramel sticky buns, and you know what? They originally came because I had the Baking with Julia cookbook. Oh. And Nancy Silverton's sticky yeah. bun recipe was in there for pecan sticky buns and she oh, I thought she it. did the I thought she did the brioche with the fruit did she do two recipes in there she maybe must she have. did and yeah she definitely laminated it and I don't think I even knew what lamination uh, was at that point I just uh, made it once and it works uh, really well and so when I went when I was at Roberta's I'm like well I like how that turned out and I took, I had just come from working at Per Se and I uh -huh. had their brioche recipe and I had been laminating things with brioche at Per Se. So I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm just going to take the brioche recipe from Per Se and uh. laminate it and do it sort of similar to how Nancy Silverton had done it in the, in the cookbook. Right, right, right. That's, that's how it came to be. But at Roberta's, it was like, it's basically a stoner breakfast food. Yeah. yeah. Um, but everybody <laughs> they look it, incredible. You know, everybody loves it. It's so it's they're small. They're not yeah. big at all. They're really small. Yeah. Um, and they're not too sweet. And they've got like an umami because they're balanced with like salt. Yeah. Um they look incredible. And, and I've gotten people have sent me photos who've made it and they turned they're out perfect. like this is yeah. like what yeah. I remember making. And I'm like, well, this is perfect. That's always like that's always so gratifying when you, the, the most, the, the most satisfying thing for me is having somebody successfully make the recipe because then I know right, I like did my job. Like I right. conveyed all the information so they could replicate it at home. So somebody, was, somebody said they made them and they were beautiful. And someone else also says that this is their favorite book of the year and she's awesome. only made 10 recipes, only 10. <laughs> wow. But wow. can't wait to get into some of the more advanced recipes. This is from Vicky again, Vicky Tran. Um, yeah. Thanks, thanks for holding my hand through my first attempts at babka and cinnamon rolls. She says. Oh, that's amazing. That's yeah, amazing. yeah. <laughs> and uh, okay, so well, we're not. We're gonna get into quite. Let me see if I have a, um, some more. Okay, so here, here's. I have another question for you. So you're you're precise, and part of that comes from your sense of precision. Comes from your background and maybe just your personality. It's my personality. And your training. Yeah. <laughs> but so when is, why is it important? And when isn't it important in baking? Ah, the precision. I think it's important yeah. in weighing out the ingredients. Cause I don't, I don't do volume at all. Yeah, yeah. Ever, really right. ever. We have Unless to convert like, everybody to weighing. We yeah, have to. I, I think I yeah. used to do like, 
vanilla extract i i take a teaspoon sure. but at this point sure. i know the conversion in my head i don't do oh, i wow. just weigh it wow it's faster for me yeah it's yeah. five grams it's faster for me just put it on a scale and weigh it mm -hmm. and i think i think that's where it really matters is is in weighing all of the ingredients and then i think I think it doesn't have to be as like the baking is not precise. The baking's very much about like what we were talking about. Like you have to use your 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 yeah, eyes yeah, and your yeah, senses. Yeah. And I'm like, is it done yeah. or not? Yeah. Is that the only place where precision isn't important? Like what about just creativity and like having ideas? Like the uh, way you just said that <clears throat> the way the the sticky buns came about. That was really like, well, you're going to take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and put it together and make something new. So in a way, that's, that's sort true. of, yeah. That's true. How do I do that? I actually, that's where <laughs> you're going to laugh. That's where the Excel spreadsheet comes into play. Well, that's true. <laughs> and also, I, I mean, do, the I do get working inspired. in restaurants, the, the I, necessity yeah. is the mother of invention very often. Yeah, I get inspired yeah. by things that I see. I'm very visual yeah. and I get inspired right. by things that I see and I like bookmark them. And then I start right. to think about like what they are and the different components. And that's mm -hmm. the creativity. Yeah. It's not yeah. about weighing right. or measuring. Right. And that's right. about the inspiration. And that's about having like a good eye. Yeah. And also a good palate. You're look, you're, and, you're trying to get, you have a flavor in mind, right? When yeah. you're doing that. Yeah. I think having a good palate. Yeah. I feel like I learned to have a good palate by working in restaurants in the city in New York. Yeah, um, yeah, not, yeah. you know, I think I grew up in central Pennsylvania in the eighties and my mom wasn't really, she cooked, mm -hmm. but she wasn't like cooking from scratch anything. Mm -hmm. And I really like when I studied in France, it was a big eye opener. I gained a lot of weight because it was so good. And oh. I was like, wow, like this is amazing. And like, just really like being open to like new flavors and, and textures and, yeah. and just throughout all of the restaurants, like taking criticism from like all of my mentors and chefs and bosses about, oh, this isn't seasoned right. And what do you do? And I think that all contributed to yeah. a, a lot of my work. The right. Timer is going off one more time. <laughs> a different timer. The other timer. timer. <laughs> someone, that, can you still hear me, Melissa? Yeah, I can still okay. hear you. So someone is asking how far in advance can Kachapuri be made um, before oh. serving? Can you make yeah. them ahead of time? You can bake them, yeah, how like several hours ahead of time. And then you just want to flash it in the oven to like give it a little reheat. When yeah. I've done them, so I just, I just here, I'm going to grab one and show you. Okay. Um, this one, this is the one that I shaped in front of you. And I, I, we were oh, so busy yeah. talking. I didn't add yeah. an egg to it. Oh yeah. 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 So, but that's, that's fine because you can just, you can, you can let it cool down. And then if you wanted to add the egg before you served it a few hours later, you could just pop it in the oven with the egg in it. So it's yeah. really, Oh yeah. Like, yeah. So you could, you could read, you could cook them halfway and yeah. then finish them with the egg. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, so I think we should um, let's answer a couple of the questions because there's yeah. right now it looks like quite a few questions. Um, some of the, oh, somebody says what which other bakers have inspired you. Oh, okay, so in my book, I think I mentioned well you've inspired me. Oh, that's a, that's, and like, I, no, I that's so true and that's why I wanted wanted to like speak with you on this like oh, your inspiration. So nice. Um. You know, obviously Claudia Fleming and Nancy Silverton, yeah, right. right? And my, Lots of my flatters. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, I'm and I'm thinking like current day, who inspires me right now? That's you know, because I can think about all of the people who've inspired me in the past, and yeah. I'm like, well, who inspires me now? And I don't know if it's one person. Right. You know, I see lots of ideas on Instagram these days. Sure. Yeah. Right. And I'll see. How about, how about for, Cedric? Like, how about Cedric Grolet in Paris? Oh, absolutely. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah, amazing, yeah. right? I don't know if I said his name right, but he's really inspiring. Yeah. I follow him. Yeah. I just Cedric love Grolet, the way yeah. he like 
puts raspberries in a tart. Like everyone in the world puts the raspberries with the bumpy side up. He puts them with the whole side up, you yeah. know, and, and they does, just look incredible. He does all of these things with fruit that are just so incredible. I actually like Pierre Hermes oh, yeah. shop too. And yeah, I get yeah. a lot of, you know, I get a lot of flavor combination inspirations that way. Yeah, um, yeah, like for all sure. of his macaroons, he like has yeah. like a fast and collection, and he comes out season by like season yeah. with different flavors. And right. I find a lot of inspiration that way, just in the flavor combinations. Right. And how about um, that other bakery in Paris? In uh, uh, you know, uh, Dupin et Daisy Day. Ah, I like. Do you know it. that one? I I do. I've been yeah. I've been. Yeah. It's yeah, really yeah. beautiful. Yeah. That chest that chestnut bread that he makes. Oh my God. It's oh, so I good. I had that one. Oh, so good. No. All right. Let's, I think, so yeah. someone is asking, let's move on to the next question. Is someone saying, are you still working in restaurants? Well. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I I am working at Gertie in Brooklyn and I have created a bagel, like a bagel program and a pastry program there. And I'm at this point, I'm working part-time and the restaurants only open part-time. The restaurants open Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And you know, that's because of COVID, right? And so, and I, it's, it's a good fit for me to work part-time there. And then I'm working on, yeah. I'm working on some recipes at home too. Um, now this is, a good question. Someone's actually, I don't know if I should, someone's saying uh, the cinnamon brown butter glaze for the babka doesn't have cinnamon in it. So <laughs> is, that, is that an oversight? I can't or tell you how many people have emailed me that question. <laughs> Did it, you leave it out it, or is it, it not, is oh, it, it a bad it title? Was unintentionally omitted. It's oh. supposed to be three quarters of a teaspoon, which okay. is a little bit, it's about a, about a gram and it was it's so unintentional. And the reason why it was unintentional is because I was trying out different recipes at different bakeries. And sometimes I'd have cinnamon in the glaze and sometimes I wouldn't. Yeah. And it was just an oversight. Mm -hmm. And well, I was talking to my editor yesterday. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. okay, we're, we're going to reprint the book. And I was like, no, this is the one you have to change. It has to be added back in. Yeah, well, just just so people know, especially with a book like this with so many details and so many recipes, it's like almost impossible to have a book without an error. Yeah. So if, if that's true. your only error, because to be honest, you could uh, just wing it on the cinnamon, right? No, it's Obviously, true. it's supposed to have cinnamon, or if you left it out, yeah. it would be okay too. So there's another, a, you know, yeah. speaking of errors, and here's an example of how crazy it can get and how yeah. this got missed. The um, polenta cake with apricot, dried apricot compote, the apricot compote, the, the volume is fine. The cups are fine, but the weight says 23 grams because the one was admitted at the end. It was supposed oh. to be 231 grams. Oh. And I've gotten that, I've been emailed that question a bunch of times too. So it's, mm. you know, you think, you think you're going through everything so meticulously and there's always like a couple things. Always, always. And even yeah. like anybody, any editor should have been like, there's no cinnamon in the cinnamon glaze, but they're so busy looking at like periods oh, and no. other yeah. things. They, it's, it's, it's easy to overlook. So yeah. um, actually here's a good question from Alexandra Holbrook. She wants to know, very general question. Whoops, where'd it go? She wants, to, she wants you to talk about a convection uh, when should and should I not use convection when I'm baking? I'm never sure. Oh, that's a good question. It is a right? good question. I have all of the recipes are tested in the book. It's written for not a convection oven, right? Because I right. I don't have a convection oven, right? No, my right. And many oven. people don't. Many people yeah. don't. But at yeah. work, I right. use only a convection oven, so I'm used to going back and forth between the two. Yeah. Convex, if you have a convection oven, you can improvise, but you have to be yeah. smart about it. And the book's yeah. not written for that. Right, but right. You can definitely be smart about it. I I prefer a convection oven, but I would never write a book for a convection oven sure. because most people don't have one. And it's too inconsistent. I mean, I do have one. And of course, when I'm writing ah. recipes, I don't use the convection feature either. But if ah. something isn't browning the way that I want it to, I might just put it on convection 
for a few yeah. minutes and then go back to the regular baking because yeah. you know no, every really, every oven I was is like, different. Even with the yeah. cacciatore, I was like, oh, it didn't brown. But I was like, well, most <laughs> of the time I've made it has been in a convection oven. But I definitely, I specifically tested it for a, a regular non-convection oven at home. Yeah. And I second guessed Ooh. myself. You're not gonna like this question. <laughs> it's okay. Can I use, can I use gluten-free <laughs> flour for the salted caramel cinnamon buns, fantails and flaky buttermilk biscuits? I usually tell people there's only one way to find out. <laughs> I think yes. You yeah. do? You think just just yeah, the straight substitution? I'm sure it will work just fine. Cup for cup? Did you do yeah, any? Cup for uh, cup. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cup for cup. That was that. The formula for cup for cup comes from Thomas Keller from Per Se, right. and right. we were working with that formula when I was at Per Se. Oh. So I know that it should definitely work. I've heard it's good. It's yeah. Okay. So Susan, who asked that question, let us know. Let Melissa know how it yes. comes out okay yeah um wow okay here's someone saying <laughs> what are three pieces of advice i don't know if this person read the book yet because you have so much good advice what are anna is asking what are three pieces of advice to someone who's a beginner to avoid some common mistakes while learning to bake oh wow well maybe not three but just give us one or two i feel like start by weighing ingredients and not using cups yeah, and absolutely. teaspoons, even though I started that way. Another piece of advice is don't just rely on the timer to tell you if something's baked or not. You have to visually look at it and say, it does it look like it's baked? Oh, does it's it baked smell then. like it's baked? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. And then what's another piece of advice is make a little plan and if it's a complicated recipe don't start out with complicated right away right. i don't i feel like don't start with sourdough right away why <laughs> start with something that's not sourdough that's just regular yeast throw like a recipe a, out there throw a recipe out there in the book like that they the should start well with. like the parker house rolls okay that, that does have sourdough starter in it, but the carrot current bread that doesn't yeah it just has right. the yeast that's right. such a good learning recipe start with that one yeah okay here's another one what is wyatt's favorite recipe <laughs> he likes the chocolate babka <laughs> of course <laughs> we eat that every day <laughs> and i was just reading your introduction to the pan au chocolat and i was um i love that you have two bars of chocolate in there and i like the way you roll them because um, oh yeah but one little piece of chocolate is just not enough you know definitely not yeah. Um, all right. Someone is saying, this is not probably a quickly answered question. Uh, an anonymous attendee is saying, as someone who also wants to switch careers and bake for a living, how did you navigate that transition and convince places to give you a chance when you had no previous experience yet? I, I went <laughs> a career change. <laughs> I like, oh my goodness. I have struggled with like financially making it work for the whole time and I but I'm satisfied with what I'm doing and I think I was so motivated to do this that I basically just called up bakeries in the 90s and asked if I could work for free right. I'm like I just Always. really want to yeah. learn like that's right. the way just intern find a right. place that is willing to like let you come in and like sure. help out for free yeah um yeah. And that that was how I learned and how yeah. I how I started. And it's also a good way to know whether it's something you really want to do. Exactly. So. Yeah, it's good practical experience. Yeah. Now here's a really basic question, but important for a beginner. What is laminating? I love that question. Yeah. Laminating is when you take dough, like yeasted dough or not yeasted dough, and you lay it down flat. And then you put a layer of butter on the top of it and then you fold the layers over and over again so you're creating this flakiness and a croissant is a laminated dough right. so that that flakiness from a croissant comes because you do that folding technique right and think about laminated wood same thing layers oh, of wood yeah, yeah, right yeah. yeah laminating it means layer 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 yeah. um Okay, so someone's, this one's sort of for both of us. Uh, when you're both testing recipes, 
Where do you start with adjustments? I'd love to start adjusting recipes as a home baker, but always afraid of adjusting the wrong ingredients. What do you do, Susan? Well, flour usually is the first thing because like I'll keep, like I just did a bunch of cookie recipes. I always start yeah. with a stick, a stick of butter. Every cookie yeah. recipe I do, I, I work off of a stick of butter. Oh, wow. So just because oh, wow. I don't know why it just makes sense, right? No, I like that. Um, and then I work with all the other ingredients for the stick of butter. So it's you know it's just sort of like it's sort of like baker's percentages. It's like, but against a stick of butter. Yeah, you know, no, like that's true. which is yeah, a thousand grams of flour. Yeah, it's like a, it's easier for me to think about the ratio. But oh, wow. if it's too much flour or not enough flour is usually the first problem with a cookie, right? Yeah, no, so, that's so true. I, that's one of, start, or it can be many things, but go ahead. It's always it in liquid. I spreadsheet and I know I calculate <laughs> oh, the yeah, ratios yeah. and I'm right. like, oh, I, first I always look at the salt and I'm like, I always go for 2.5% to the ratio of flour and I'm yeah. like, oh, okay. And then I look at the sugar and I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take people's recipes and I'll put them side by side. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I do that too. And yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. This person's doing this and this yeah, person's yeah, doing yeah. that. So what would be right for me that I would? Do? You're gonna laugh because I do a very un <laughs> a very unscientific kind of spreadsheet no. where I do this where I compare what different people do so oh, I, I like can that. under so I can understand what the parameters are so that yeah, yeah, it, yeah. that was actually a very good question. I'm gonna try to show you one yeah. and maybe you can teach me how to do a spreadsheet. <laughs> But a legal pad actually works your, pretty your well. Your brother probably does spreadsheets, right? It's yeah, yeah, yeah. He does. He's probably laughing at me right now. Oh, yeah. So, like, look, this is one of my spreadsheets. Oh, wow. No, that's it. You've got it. <laughs> so, it get, helps me see where what I can uh, what He I just can said that he was going to say that he does that. Wait, I'm not really looking at the chat right now. I'm, we're almost done. Oh, yeah. David said I was just going to say that. Yeah um we probably have to stop soon all right somebody's wow. talking about vanilla extract um i don't think we have time to go into that but uh wait oh somebody somebody's asking a similar recipe with how do you start with developing a recipe do you go based off of something you know another recipe and start tweaking from there sometimes I do that a lot. Sometimes, sometimes not I do that a lot and sometimes i think after you've been doing it for so long you just sort of have a a, a feel about what you want to do exactly that's what i i often have my end result in mind and yeah. uh and then it's how to, the the journey to get there yeah that's um, right oh yeah so the cinnamon brown butter we addressed yes yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh I don't know if we can get into this. Oh, okay, here's a good one. I don't have a stand mixer and we live in a small space, but I do have a powerful hand mixer. Is a stand mixer worth the investment to get the same results? I think you should try this, the hand mixer first and try to get the results with yeah. that. Yeah. Absolutely. Don't buy a stand mixer just because you think it's gonna be better. First, learn off of what you have. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Cause then you'll be better. Like I learned to drive on a, Volks a, a four speed Volkswagen bug and I could drive anything. Cool. <laughs> it's the same with baking, right? It's the same it thing. Is. If, it is. if you learn how to drive on something really rough and rudimentary, yeah, you know, it translates. You can do I learned how to mix with a handheld mixer. <laughs> This might be, uh, well, all right, I'm gonna ask you two more quick questions. Um, you probably want, I, I, everyone always asks this when you have a book out, but what's your favorite recipe in the book? Do you have one favorite? Oh, I love the buckwheat <laughs> queen of mine, but I don't know if that's uh, my favorite, but I would, okay. I would have been thinking about that one a lot. That one caught my eye and I'm definitely yeah. thinking about making it. I'm going to show it real quick. I added chocolate chips to is, it. Is once, this so the buckwheat? Like, is that the yeah, buckwheat? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah that's on I my love list. That one. That's on my list. Another one on my list is um, the sour cream coffee cake, which I grew up loving that. I haven't had one in years. Um, someone else is asking if you could spend a few hours chatting with uh, any chef from history, who would it be? 
Oh, I think I want to talk to maybe I don't know. That's hard, right? Yeah, be a hard. child maybe. Well, yeah, of course. Right? Her, right? That's an obvious one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this this shot is so great. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, I love this. I'm gonna that's make that. Cop, that's the sour cream coffee cake. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just see if, oh, somebody says, Melissa, you're a great teacher. Now that you're an experienced pastry chef and you've written a book, what other goals do you have? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I, I like writing books. So I wanna keep writing books. Um, and I'm working on a second book, uh, just bread, sourdough bread. Yay. I feel like, what are my goals? I, I don't know if I wanna open up a restaurant, right? This has been like a really hard time for restaurants. So I don't, I don't think that's you my do. Goal anymore, <laughs> I but I know. do like the idea of doing more books and doing something in 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 related to books and teaching because I enjoy that a lot. That's great. That's great. And one one last thing: Have you had a favorite thing to bake during the pandemic? Oh boy, I just a loaf of bread, sourdough bread. Yeah, so me too. Good. Me but too. Been, yeah, right. I keep making it over and over again. Yeah, me too. Because it becomes like this amazing ritual. Yeah, right? it does. and it's calming. It really calms me down. <laughs> yeah, and I and then I have it, and I can like have toast in the morning with yeah. it, toast and yeah. coffee or toast and tea. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. It keeps it keeps you fed. It keeps you calm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I I think um, it's nine o'clock. So I think that we're probably wrapping up, so. right? Um. Are we supposed to do something in particular to finish? Ah, like oh, there we are. <laughs> hey there. <laughs> oh, Hi. wonderful. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Susan. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is really fantastic. Sure. And, uh, I love just being a fly on the wall. Uh, yeah. <laughs> talk shop. So thank you for joining us. Sure, um, thanks for having us. us. Yeah, and thank you to all of our attendees. Thanks to everyone who attended tonight. Um, this talk will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, after Wonderful. the event. Yeah, so within 48 hours, if you know someone who missed tonight's event, uh, feel free to uh, to pass that link on to them or let them know that Great. it's on the YouTube channel. Great. And uh, Good Bake, again, is available at booklarder.com. Um, we do have signed copies. So thanks, Melissa, for selling it, sending us some, some book plates. Um, Definitely. We, we've just been so excited to host you and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm gonna close it out, but uh, hopefully we all get to see each other in Seattle when it's safe to. Yeah, yeah. that would be Definitely. nice. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming, Thank everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a good night and enjoy the kachapuri. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Good night. Good night.